who's going to talk to us about her um, recent research that we just done last summer. Is this when you did this? Yeah. Awesome. Well, I, I published it last summer, but it was done a couple of years before COVID. Right. Two years before COVID. That's <laughs> that's how we look at things now. Right. Pre post <laughs> So she is a professor of anthropology and sociology right here on our campus. So I'm excited for you to learn more about the work that she does. Um, let's give her a welcome. Yeah. Let's see her on here. So I I usually have a different style. I like to do the TED Talk style of roaming around, but I'm. I've got this thing that I've got to carry around, so I don't know. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Thumbs up? Good. I wish that we would offer this class of yours to the behavioral science um, programs. Anybody can come. I think that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to consider it making it a part of either an elective or uh, I think this is brilliant. Anyway, thank you. And uh, let me just tell you uh, just a tiny bit about myself. I grew up as a rancher's daughter, so I've got a degree in beef production. <laughs> Who would have thought? I don't know how I'm going to use that one. Um, and then I also got a degree in journalism because I just love school. <laughs> you know, I'm one of those crazy people that couldn't keep off campus. And then I got a master's in social organization and finally a doctorate in cultural anthropology. And uh, along the way, I became interested in alternative sexual patterns. So I am one of the world experts on polygyny, which is one man marrying several wives, a Mormon fundamentalist polygamy, particularly is my expertise. But then after about 25 years of publishing five books and 20 art articles on it, I thought, I want to try something different. <laughs> And so it seemed like I was going to these conferences all the time that were, that were presenting the, these ideas about polyamory. And so I switched to polyamory and I don't want to publish anything more about polygyny. <laughs> I've done enough. And so this is much more interesting on a personal level and on a uh, gender dynamic level for me. And I'll tell you why in this study. So let's go ahead and dive right in. And I challenge you at the end to come up with things that are wrong with this study. I've got thick skin and I've got a whole list of things that could have been done better, that should be done better for future research because that's what science is all about. You know, can we create a better instrument? Can, can we avoid a bias or mistakes based on the scientists? Science is great, but the scientists are the ones that are screwing up science. So let's, let's critique this process. Did you have a hand up? Oh, okay, specificity. All right, so not the beef production one? You can if you want. Okay. Um, USU, beef production and journalism. <laughs> what was I thinking? And then uh, Portland State. So USU is Utah State University. I grew up in Utah, one of those, uh, and now I'm a, kind of a Mormon refugee in Vermont. Um, and, and then the master's degree in social organization was from Portland State University. No one's ever asked me about my resume in classes before. Thanks for caring. And then my PhD was at University of Utah. And actually, the other Emily, Emily Scott, just came from there. And uh, Bo Knackley also is an alma mater, so we're, we're quite the trio. And that was in cultural anthropology. Got it? Okay, so um, let me just give you an abstract and then I'm gonna uh, discuss the nitty gritties of this. this. This project was recently published in the journal, the UK journal that's published by the SAGE uh, Publication Group, which is the housing publication group for many, many different peer-reviewed journals. This is an onerous, stick in the mud peer review process that took a full year and a half. So that means it's rigorous with many, many different reviews, many different reviewers, and that means that it's one I respect. There's a lot of journals out there that pay you or you pay, you know, and there's, there's all kinds of subterfuge out there, so you really got to choose a good journal. And this is one of those, UK Journal Sexualities and it's Polyamory in Paris, a social network theory application. And it was published um, last summer. So you should be able to find a keywords, polyamory, Janet. <laughs> so 
Um, the abstract is basically multiple sexual partners, and I'm going to define everything. And so hold your questions to the end if you don't mind. Um, multiple sexual partnerships, which is the essence of polyamory, can be viewed as networks or community-based structures in order to assess the links between lovers and metamors. Metamors are your lover's lover or your partner's lover as well as the larger polycool. Polycool is your network of lovers, metamors, friends, and associates. It's your little mini community network. In such, an incidentally polycool was taken from the potato studies, which have a polycool network. Anyway, it's polyamorous love to dabble in that kind of thing of taking things from science and putting it into their own uses. In such non-monogamous networks where participants share friendship, ideas, sex, and economic resources, there exists a vast web of nodes. Nodes are the dots between the vertices, which are the links that you have with another person. So I'm going to visualize this in your mind, and then we'll have drawings and, and uh, um, network uh, graphics. There exists a vast web of nodes connected in much more intimate and complex ways than one finds in the mononormative landscape. The results show, and again, this is just the abstract. We're going to go through the details of the study in a moment. The results show that those with high resilience and centrality, and in a network analysis, that means who is centrally located based on density, the number of connections you have with others, just like in high school, remembered, you counted your friends and those of others to be popular. Transitivity, which is a triangular analysis that we'll look at in a moment. And homophily, it means birds of a feather flock together, those things that you have in common with each other that draw you together, are typically females with strong sense of family and a talent for interpersonal communication. High modularity, modularity is a term that means that you've got clusterability, <laughs> is that a word? That you can cluster well. <laughs> I think you may know what I mean. Think of high school again. Shows clustering tendencies aligned with these qualities. Kink, atypical intellect, gender sexual fluidity, and mitigating factors of race and class. Doesn't that sound like much of NVU Johnson right there? <laughs> so I think that th there may be some of this going on right here without us uh, realizing. So my objectives are, I really wanted to know what's the nature of the poly network. I was excited in my transition from polygyny to polyamory. I was so excited. I asked some basic uh, you know, first year experiences questions like, what is this like? What is the nature of this? This is always a standard good first question in science. Um, how are people connected to each other in these poly cools? And, and I emphasize cool as in C-O-O-L because of course it is cool. Who has the highest level of affluence, or excuse me, influence and resilience? Is it males or females? So above all, I'm a gender dynamic specialist. I've always looked at how gender plays a role in all of these dynamics. So this was part of my heart and soul. I wanted to know about this. To examine correlates of concurrent involvement, which means that you're with two or more people at the same time, in multiple sexual partnerships among 62 Parisians who adhere to the core values of polyamory, polyamoire, Paris, Facebook group, using ethnographic and social network analysis methodologies. That was my hope. And I also wanted to see some few friends that I had. So I used that grant money to do some extraordinary business and friendship <laughs> in the two years I went to Paris. Um, and when you look at the literature review, there's all kinds of polyamory scholarship. Uh, Chef, Cleese. And maybe we should define polyamory. How many of you know what that is? One, two, three, four, five, six. So it's many loves. That's the basic definition. Uh, a person has many different loves uh, concurrently. So 
it doesn't mean that you're doing a threesome necessarily. It means that you love this person and it's okay to also love this person and it's okay also to love this person because of the values you share about it being okay. Romantic shows Oh, many. <laughs> the love word is about lesbian polyamory and Game of Thrones is all about polyamory if you think about it and, and some of it's nasty business. Well, the sister wives is polygyny. So let's not, let's not confuse those two. Polygyny is where one, and I love Big Love and Sister Wives. I wrote chapters on those. And Big Love was actually framed after my first ethnography by two uh, gay Mormon boys who wrote the program. And then uh, Tom Hanks published it, or directed it, whatever you call it. And um, that is where one man marries two or more wives. And it's, it's much more patriarchal in that kind of uh, arrangement than polyamory. Polyamory is uh, a bit more favorable to feminist thought. So anyway, I looked at all these scholarship, uh, the scholars that had written about this, and uh, I also looked at uh, social network theory for the first time, and I was excited about that because it involved a lot of math and computer programs that I was excited about, like Gephi 9.2. And so Greg Petrick's is it Petrix or Petrix? What do you say? Does he like that? I say Petrix. Let's find out the truth. Is it Petrix? Like Petri dish? Okay, Petrix. Okay, you're very confident. I'll say it that way. I also looked at the scant other evidence of anyone doing network theory, and guess what? No one did, and so I knew I was going to have my chance because there wasn't much. There was the L word, and here's the picture of that. Um, lesbian show of fictive characters that are linked in a network. Maybe you've seen that show, series. It involves a lot of uh, cross-sectional lesbian love, but also bisexuality, and so there's this uh, amazingly complex. But these are not real people, okay? <laughs> this is fictional. And then I looked at the, my friend's Game of Thrones network, and I thought, I could do better than that with real life. And so, I, pardon me? Tiger King has polyamory network? Kinda, there's two married Oh gosh. I'm gonna use that as an example of bad ecotourism. Um, I teach the ecotourism class, so that's, yeah, we're gonna go, go there. And I looked at all these things, and I couldn't really find anyone that had done anything, and so I thought, here's my chance. And so I was toying with this, you know, while I was in Paris, waiting for a friend, and talking with other members of the polyamory group, and I started drawing some stuff. You know, and I, I got excited about these these graphic networks, and uh, so I think part of science is getting sci excited about something that thrills you, and so that you can ask questions that other people are asking as well. So through the literature, I also found a lot of evolutionary psychology not to be trusted entirely. They're very reductionistic, but some of them have some ideas, but most of them are very patriarchal outcomes. They found that, uh, you know, basically, um, yeah, it's a male world and men drive the systems and men have more lovers and they're more active than women and that's the way that the world is. I also looked at pornographic film literature. I, I looked at um, polyamory literature and um, I was looking at some of the traditional porn and evolutionary psychology, which never has been said together in one sentence before, I'm sure. Um, they tend to reinforce these heteronormative stereotypes as males, uh, of males as central social actors with multiple sexual partners and women as sexually passive. Feminist literature, on the other hand, of a new vanguard of uh, porn filmmakers like Erica Lust, who's a sociologist from Sweden who went into the porn business. Uh, she wrote uh, peer-reviewed papers on this subject, and so did many other polyamorous and feminist scholars, looking at the reality, plus the ethnographic record bears this out, that in fact, there's more agenic female sexual response in network building. Now you may ask, what the hell does that mean? Agenic female sexual response in network building. It means that a lot of the, the core players are females, so that female 
that polyamory itself is more female driven. So this was a change from the polygyny and big love stuff that I had been working with before. So I crafted a hypothesis based on the literature that says that Paris poly will exhibit more endogamy and gender fluidity than larger sexual networks. I was interested in that. Gender fl uh, fluidity means that there will be more experimental uh, cross-sectional activity, uh, not only across uh, sexual orientation, but gender role identity to accommodate um, an enhanced sexual experience, but also to expand the polycool. And endogamy is an anthropological term. Anybody know what that is, endogamy? It means that you marry within the group. So this is a very small insular group where marriage comes from, or matings come from within. My second one was using social network analysis. I wanted to show greater centrality and frequency among females, or cis females and trans females. OK? So there you go. Uh, how do I begin to prove such a thing? You know, because I was, I was feisty mad at the uh, evolutionary psychologist and the, the, the traditional porn film makers. And so I thought, OK, I'm going to prove this. And so I started to dig. And what I do is I'm a, an ethnographer. I do qualitative research. I live inside a community, immerse myself in that community, and I ask questions. And I, I, I tried to take a Verstehen view, the German word for understanding, which is uh, something that uh, Max Weber proposed many, many decades earlier, that you've got to have a little empathy to do good research. And so you have to remove your biases and try to just you know, um, take on and understand the native's perspective. And so that's, what I, that's the kind of work I was doing in Paris. I did a convenient sample of 45 Facebook members with extension chain sampling of 17 more, so it's a total of 62, because somebody's always, always got a, a metamor they want to talk about, or a, a, a friend who has some connection to the group. So I was able to get a fuller, uh, a more full depiction of the network. I also did in-depth interviews, poly meetings, discussions, where we met together in the Moray, in the Café Entre, not Entre Nous, that's a film. Uh, uh, oh gosh, what was it called? Uh, I can't remember the name of the cafe. It's been two years. But it was in the Marais, not far from uh, the Notre Dame. And I did participant observation and um, a lot of the demographic surveys with the Facebook members. So it's easy to do on Facebook. Facebook's a godsend for behavioral research. I also did social network analysis. And some of the demographic findings were that gender, uh, Dynamics were 42% females, 44% males, 13 other or non, uh, trans, bi, pansexual, that defined as bi or gender nonconforming. Um, the age was about 30, 31. The race, predominantly white, predominantly um, upper middle class, uh, highly, highly educated folk. So there's a class depiction, a demographic uh, Co correlate with, with um, you know, class. These are white, predominantly white, upper class, um, middle to upper class, uh, highly educated folk. Not too religious, mostly into non-structured paganism, uh, eco-nativism, uh, and um, mystic spirituality. And they had various love styles, uh, love anarchists. Uh, some were hierarchical, which means that you, you do have uh, some people you prefer over others in your hierarchy. Some were neutral. And the love structure was different too. Kitchen table means you want everybody to know everything about your business and you want to know theirs. To the point of, how did it go? Were you on top? Were you on bottom? You know, they want to know. And then there's parallel. Don't talk to me about your sex with others. I don't want to know. So those were the two different styles. So the in-depth interviews <laughs> showed that it's challenging to be poly in France, because France is basically a patriarchal mess. <laughs> we thought we were the only ones. There's you know, this history of Simone de Beauvoir and uh, Sartre and all these love, love, love things. But by and large, it's OK 
for which is the goose and the gander? I never get that right. It's okay for the is the goose male? Is the gander male? I never got that. Anyway, so they they believe that men are appropriately polyamorous and women are not. And so if you express yourself as being polyamorous and you're female, it's a stigma. Um, the aristocratic clandestine adultery is okay. Just keep it to yourself and don't proclaim it. Keep it quiet. Men cheat, not women. Discretion, safe face, don't come out. Do not come out of that closet. Uh, and the population was very small, so it's, it's very in, insular. Um, this is a Facebook group of uh, approximately 300 active participants, and I, I you know, had a sample of 62. Hint, hint, delimitations, or you know, problems with the study. Um, their insular endogamous behaviors where they had similar values, they believed in consent, respect, open communication, ethical non-monogamy, non-violent communication, compersion, which means I'm okay with you being in love with somebody else. I'm your lover, but you're, you, you are fully okay with loving somebody else. Uh, so it's an enhanced, advanced version of empathy. Um, dating lovers, lovers, and friends is fine. I like you, I like your choice of partner, so I'll sleep with your partner. Hmm. Gender fluidity, especially among women. Women would um, easily transition into bisexuality, more so than men. Cis females were actually much more gender fluid than cis males. Uh, sexual and ideology nonconformity, you know, sexual li libertines, uh, very common in Paris, um, where you know experimentation, BDSM, is, uh, uh, consent-based um, group sex, it's all fine, and some economic sharing. There's also some zebra tendencies. In France, they call atypical intellect, such as Asperger's, or again any. Uh, um, spectrum of autism, um, atypical, and it's embraced as being okay. You know, this is kind of beatnik, actually, to have Asperger's in, in Paris, and this group was very beatnik. And they felt that these skills of atypical intellects were what bonded them together. It's defined as those who fail to recognize social cue cues and resist engaging in stereotypical behavior ultimately non-conformists and they don't care that they're breaking those social rules at all. And they may not even be aware that they are. Relationship anarchy of freedom, abundance, individuality, respect, consent, anti-everything, anti-capitalism, anti-binary, anti-hetero, anti-patriarchy, and uh, customized sexuality, including kink, BDSM, swinging, sex clubbing, slow love, and orgasmic meditation. These are some of the workshops and clubs that overlapped with the polyamory group. My ethnographic summary, and I know I'm saying a lot very rapidly, but I've got so much to show you. So if you have a hand up that you need to know something burning, I'll answer it, but otherwise, maybe questions at the end. Um, Paris, poly, is an insular, endogamous, extremely fluid network with high levels of homophily. Birds of a feather flock together. Links are formed between those who embrace feminism, veganism, love anarchy, predominantly white, liberal, socialist, geeky gamers, ecologically aware, highly educated, upper middle class, but who come from parents who are lower class. I really dug into this and found that interesting irony. They have similar psychological profiles and ethnographic backgrounds and are zealous supporters of the same poly ideals, eschewing any conventional labels. The worst thing that could happen to someone in this group is for you to be called normal. So then I started to apply um, the, the logic of social uh, network analysis before I crunched the numbers. I was just kind of looking at the logic. I've got to figure out these people and, and use dots or nodes and link them to others in terms of sexual uh, uh, connection, money, or friendship. Um, and if the line is thick, it's a multiplex link. Um, and if it's um, 
well, I'll just show you. Star constellations reveal tendencies of non-hierarchical love, and most of these came from males. So this is my legend. So you can see all of the categories, and it, it, there's so much more to be done. I need to have more categories of love as they keep evolving. Um, so there's the node, there's the dyad between two, two very in love people or people who've been together like a you know, traditional husband and wife. Um, there's a sex a line, a money line, friendship, a triad, which is common among unicorns situation where a dyad, a husband and wife often take into their polycool a female who's bisexual. Um, a quad where two couples who've been swinging like to swing with each other more often than others. And so they have a quad. Uh, Solopoly or um, constellation is where typically you have a cisgendered male who has several lovers, but he's not invested in learning more about them. He's, he's very casual. Uh, or a, a full anarchist star where that um, typical cis male is, is going full, full go, you know, and, and having uh, twice or thrice the number of lovers. And Monte Poly, where one uh, partner doesn't want to have multiple lovers, but just allows for their partner to do so. So I drew this based on the numbers of nodes and the types of connections, and it was a raw, um, what is that, alpha graphics, whatever I used, the, just a, a simple art design software. Um, I can't remember the name of it. What, what is it that we all use for drawing? Um, this was one of those. <laughs> I think it was Alpha Graphics. And colors and shapes. And I actually had a Linden graphic arts stu student help me with this. I drew it on paper, and then they, they put it in. But you can see that there's some clustering going on. And that, that uh, you know, the center of this, this yellow big circle, which is supposed to be green, uh, <laughs> um, which is a, a number 24 and 17, and over here the yellow 40, and number one on the, the light blue turquoise, they all have uh, centrality uh, tendencies and uh, density tendencies. So my initial observations were a strong tendency for diffusion and bridging, nodes presenting novel ideas between people. Um, and uh, that especially these new people at meetings stimulate new energy, relationship energy for exchanges. Uh, clustered polycool structures emerge in larger network indicating high clusterability or modularity. Um, but the problem is already there were delimitations and, and, and criticisms to my study. No one can seem to agree on what constitutes a link. No one agrees about love. So I, I showed this drawing back to the group and the women said, why didn't you, why did you include that guy? I had sex with him, but I'm not in love with him. And the cis males said just the opposite. Janet, pourquoi tu not? Well, you know, in, in English, they said, <laughs> why did you not include this lover and this lover and this lover? I had sex with them. And I thought, what, were you in love with them? N'importe quoi, it doesn't matter. So each had a different version of what love is and who to include in their polycool because of that. The women wanted to guard their reputations. The men wanted to enhance their reputation by having more lovers. So that was a serious uh, problem with the, the study. Uh, uh, I began to look at density and multiplexity, the proportion of direct ties in a network that often relates to how many lovers do you have, but also how many lovers do you have that are, that are friends, that you have something in common with more than just coitus. Um, and I began to form the nature of these ties. Many times they would meet uh, at workshops, poly workshops that were designed to enhance kink um, uh, some were there because they liked the same uh, computer conferences. So I said there was a high geek factor, very high. Uh, many computer scientists are also polyamorous, who also love kink, who are um, atypical thinkers. And so sometimes they would overlap at these, these venues um, and then would 
disclosed a gender role identity that was nonconformist or queer, and also that their sexual orientation was more fluid. So I began to look at all of these characteristics, and I was able to understand and put those into an Excel document that could be testing for correlations later. I was looking at centrality, the measure of strong ties of influence, importance, and central positions in the network, uh, transitivity, clustering, et cetera. I also invented a term, and I haven't so far had anyone get angry with me. Usually in science and in these journals, if you come up with a new term, the bigwigs who know social network analysis will start slamming you. And so far, it's been a year, nobody said anything. So let's cross our fingers. But people had said things about bridging or weak ties, but I invented this concept of indirectedness, where you count the number of ties that you have through others. It's not enough to have direct friends and lovers. To build a network central position, you have to build friendships and associations with, with others through your lovers and friends. So suppose that um, you two are friends directly, but then you're friends with you, and so then that means that you have an indirect friendship with you. And that's going to give you an edge, a strength, a, an understanding. A, a possibility of connection. And so that's what I'm talking about indirectness. And uh, throughout the history of the world, women have often worked that way. Uh, men too, but it's mostly direct ties that men focus on. Women often focused on triangles and indirect ties. So here was my first attempt with Greg Petrix. <laughs> I'm never going to get that right. And we were at a Linden uh, workshop. Did, were you there two years ago? <laughs> we were trying to get along with Linden. And we, we met over there, and we were so bored. And Isaac was on my left, and Greg was on my right, and I was new at Johnson. And um, so we, we did my analysis while we were at the back of the class. Um, and he created this with me using Gephi uh, 9.2. And he'd never seen the, the, the software before, so he was just so excited. And since then, he's been using it for other things. But you can see some clustering. So it's 24 of the most like, nodes. Oh, God. 24 rocks. 24 is way up there. Um, one is fabulous. She's really got her community going. She's got two husbands, and then she's also bisexual. And so she's got uh, connections to three or four well, lovers. Four and 40, well, we can't use names for confidentiality, right? So numbers, I've got the numbers written down somewhere in a locked cabinet, <laughs> just so I'll remember them. But uh, yeah, it's, it, it's, it, you've got to guard their anonymity and confidentiality. Um, yeah, uh, 40 is, is very strong, um, uh, 24, 1, so we're going to be looking at then uh, another uh, Gephi model. So I, I, I went to Paris and I delivered this and I said, can you help me with some number crunching and let's use the Gephi model. And so Mark Santorini said, oh, I can, I can do better than Greg Petrix. And so he and I created this. And in it, we were looking at directional links. Like, I like you, but if he doesn't come back and admit that I'm his lover, then it's a one-sided arrow. If it's two-sided, he also claimed you as a lover. <laughs> so this is where the, the gender dynamic is. Some women did not claim some men as links because they, weren't, they were either embarrassed about the connection, it was a one-night stand that went bad, or there was no emotional feeling. Whereas the men said, oh yeah, one, two, three, four, five, and, and they wanted to count. They wanted to have that counting uh, matter. And so you have uh, these, these clusters emerge with one and 40 and 24 emerging. So here we go, 40 wins the day. 
Uh, 40 uh, has 41 density, 18 divided by 44, so there, I, I try to include some math there for, for the reader. Um, 18 very strong uh, bridging ties, um, so strong density, strong bridging ties or indirectedness, uh, bisexual, trans, zebra, kink politically and economically connected and truly the queen of the polycool a trans female that is a dynamo, very strong in all areas. Uh, 24, density of 70%, um, yet I didn't put her at the top because of some of the um, problems associated with uh, this issue of number of lovers. And so um, some of these are still being looked at. Uh, but 31, uh, indirect ties, bisexual, a caregiver, wanted to create a strong family structure. Um, and number one, 38% uh, density, 17 bridging ties. So let's just look at some of the, the elements of this, and then I'll stop for questions. Um, I think I'm still OK on time, right? So transitivity is counting the triangles that exist in the network. So you locate the number of triangles each node or person has, indicating the, the strength and influence of their, their position. So if you have ties to two people over here, maybe even through your, through your lover or friend, if you have a, another triangle over here, and, and it, it does touch on indirectedness as well, then the, the person with the the most triangles is actually more connected, has stronger ties of influence. And you can even see how this works in faculty assembly meeting. <laughs> or any business, or at, in, you know, in the dining room, or wherever, in your friendship circles. Try this out. Count the number of triangles you have. Do your own networks. And if you want, get Greg to help you with a Guffy. So I found that 24 had 11 triangles. Uh, 40 and 20, so, so really one of the reasons why 24 is moving up the, the ranking here is very strong density, very strong uh, triangles or transitivity. Number one had six, uh, number 17, 28, and 25 had five, number 40 and 47 had four. And these are what they look like as if, you know, um, that you can count the number and you can use Gephi for, for all of this. The homophily uh, was where I did the zebra, kink, queer, um, and um, B for, for in intellect. And I did a, a NOVA one-way analysis and found that um, these connections of um, overlapping likeness didn't really matter. I was trying to test that between males and females because that was my hypothesis. It didn't really show much, but I had to include it into the study because I wanted to show that, huh, maybe the nature of the links isn't as important as the durability of those links. What I did find was that um, though there was um, kink and queer appeared to be strong ten tendencies, uh, gender differences are not strongly correlated to those. Um, as many men as females were interested in kink and, and uh, queerness. Um, there are a few female outliers that have multiplex traits. The idea is that if you have enough traits that are similar with more of the people in your group, you'll have a stronger position. And I did, uh, it, there was an indication that women had uh, more multiplex traits, but they weren't really tied to uh, these strong indicators. So. I kind of uh, apologized, <laughs> not in a, uh, in a way that you'd think, but I, I said, I tried this, it didn't work. And so that's okay in a study. Then the next person that comes along can say, well, you know, maybe I'll try again on my group. It didn't work on her group, but I'll, I'll try it. Or since it didn't work with her, I'll go in another direction. Summary. Social network analysis has proved to be very useful and fun. To view Paris as a unique, tiny poly network that exhibits high levels of endogamy, homophily, and modularity. 
females showed more strength and resilience with higher number of intimate ties to others across polycools, more transitive and peripheral links to metamors and friends, and interestingly, a strong sense of family. So all of these were mentioned separately in other studies uh, and indicated that this must be true about female networking, but I brought them all together in one study. Females were more likely to adopt hierarchical, dyadic, and triadic bonds with two to four lovers, whereas males were more likely to adopt non-hierarchical anarchist star configurations with four to seven. So though men had slightly more lovers, they did not have enduring, lasting ties with these individuals based on a multiplex arena of uh, uh, factors. Females were more likely to adopt bisexuality and pansexuality. Uh, overall, high tendency towards kink, atypical intellect, gender fluidity, and race and class privilege. In short, my data showed that cis and trans women with a strong sense of family and skills in interpersonal communication score highest on network metrics of density, degree, homophily, indirectness, and transitivity. The network data also indicate high modularity and endogamy with clustering tendencies for both cis men and cis and trans women linked to kink, atypical intellect, sexual and gender nonconformity, and mitigating factors of socioeconomic advantage and racial privilege. So before you, well, yeah, before I show you the delimitations or problems of of what I think I did wrong, and I mentioned this in my article, bring it on. What did you think went wrong with this study? Or could have done better? What would you have done better? Yes. I don't know if they would have made them uncomfortable, but could you come out and have like a conference and got them all in one room and like interplay? Like <clears throat> Excellent idea. We did that, oh. and we showed them my crude first time drawing, and that's when we had a two hour debate about what love is and what love is not. And it was really difficult to pinpoint a definition of what constitutes a love link. You know, is it sexuality? Is it love plus sex? Is it a mode of sex? Is it just simply a one night stand? Is it a link between those people who adhere to BDSM or sex clubbing? And so it got more complicated. And um, that's why I decided to actually work individually um, and let people each define what the nature of their love was. But that, that creates low validity. You know, if, you're, if you have different measures of love, that's a problem. Yes? So what ended up being your answer for what love is? Well, um, this is the first step towards getting an answer. It's not the end-all answer. What I've suggested in my future research is that we need to have some kind of citizen science apparatus. And I tried to get that going, and then what happened is COVID hit. I was in Paris with a $5,000 grant waiting. <laughs> and I had all my people in a row, the, the computer scientists, the, you know, the other geeky gamers. And we were all ready to go with the citizen science fabulous software that was going to create an icon for each person, an anonymous, an anonymous icon that they would play, pretend to be, and that the system would keep it anonymous. And then they could list their various nodes based on the criterion that we all agreed. So there were 10 different criterion of married, but um, married with sex, married with no sex, um, asexual, uh, uh, one night stand or casual sex. Uh, you know, and they, we had a whole list of about 10 to 12 categories and all they had to do was list th that type of relationship and it would have been automatically done, but I didn't get, I couldn't do it. So that's in the future. Hey, are we gonna go back? Yes, just as soon as we can be let back in. Um, I think that they've shut us off again because of the variant, but we'll see. Any other questions of what you might have looked for or what was wrong? Um, it's not about what's wrong, but can I ask you a couple questions? Sure. I have two questions. I was wondering why Paris, why did you pick that to do with it there? 
I love Paris. <laughs> That's a song, I think. I think I also, you know, to be honest, I had a friend and I wanted to see him, but also do research. And it was either Paris or Berlin. My, my next step was Berlin because I wanted to also go to where there are big, uh, where there are polyamorous Facebook groups. Montreal has one. And I'm I'm doing some research there. Yeah, don't they have like big sex clubs in Montreal? They do. It's a big group. Um, the biggest of all is San Francisco. Um, so they have tens of thousands of polyamorous that are active, and that's a a huge group. And so that obviously needs to be tapped into. But Paris and Berlin were on my list in my original grant, and. Um, Paris seemed more logical for me as a first step because I, I love Paris. I, I've always gone back to Paris. And so next is Berlin um, and um, Vienna, and then uh, compare those groups to Montreal. Okay. And then my other question was, if you could, could you explain the density? What is that? Density is simply the number of direct links that you have with others, direct. Primarily sexual links, um, because of the fact that not everybody had economic links, and so uh, I, I really relied heavily on the, the the sexual links that they had, direct links of sex, friendship, and money, but mostly sexuality. Yeah. The what? The zebra is a, a French term. It's a based on the work of, oh God, I don't know if I can find it, this famous uh, Parisian uh, psychologist. And I think that I can find it eventually for you and get it for you, um, who came up with this notion that we need to actually categorize people who have similar traits in along the spectrum of autism and Asperger's and um, zebra. And it's basically atypical thinkers that have a uh, tendency to uh, discard any kind of social normalcy or conformity and who are, um, in fact, ill at ease with any kind of uh, intrusive conformity. And so um, it overlaps, okay, an atypical, here I've got it, <laughs> that is considered exceptional, non-conventional thinking, often involving speaking or behaving in defiance of the cultural norm. It can often be an obstacle to integrating into mainstream society and adopting the social gra graces. So these are people who don't realize that they're being maybe socially offensive sometimes, but they, they are following their um, ideology and their thought process. Uh, it overlaps with Asperger's. Um, and this is Fachin, 2008. I have the reference if you want. OK, so let's look at the delimitations and open it up to more questions if you want. I was very aware of what was wrong with my study. And I think it's important at the end of your research that you go ahead and put these. Sometimes they're called qualifications, delimitations. What do you call them, Emily? You just have strengths and limitations. Limitations, OK. So uh, there, it's the same thing. What's wrong? What could be improved upon? For, for anyone trying to replicate your study, you want to have this guidepost for them. Uh, obviously, I have a small sample, 62 out of 300. I really needed to reach out to more people. And um, because of the problems with low internal validity, um, you know, can we really actually call this a, a, a scientific project? I think it's the beginning of looking towards answers. Um, internal validity in this case was, did I measure what I was intending to measure? Well the example of how to define love and what a loving connection is, is a problem because no one can agree. Humans are crazy and complex. They're not as easy as animals and plants. We have this cortex that makes us lie. And we also have creative interpretations of behavior. 
and disagreements about what really is you know, happening. For example, if you were to, even in a lab environment um, like this, um, try to control all the variables, which is yet another um, um, pathway to high internal validity, is to control the variables and make sure that there is no spuriousness. If we were to do that and I were to um, have you write a test right now, get a piece of paper out, yada, 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 and I were to lower the temperature because it seems a little hot in here, wouldn't you do better on that? What cooler temperatures tend to make people do better. But there's contaminating variables. It could be that you just didn't get enough sleep or you didn't have lunch. You know, we're, humans are highly complex. And so it was very difficult for me to pinpoint a, a consistent definition of what comprises a good link and various other problems. It had high external validity because I lived with this group on and off for two years and I got to know them so well that when I was able to just hang out with them in a naturalistic environment and do qualitative ethnographic research, I can tell you that it was quite representative of the reality that existed there. And so uh, for that reason, the, the, the external validity was high. But again, love is defined differently. That was a problem. And I only was able to access the educated English proficient folks. I speak French OK, pas mal. But you know, when you're in an intellectual group, they speak wicked fast. And I missed a lot. And they have their own jargon based on 25 years of living in Paris. So. Um, because of that, I had to get interpreters or people who were willing to speak English with me. That's a big limitation. Um, and only Facebook poly folk were involved. What about all those people who don't want to be on Facebook? I think that's a thing now, right? You know, my daughters don't like Facebook. <laughs> so they would be left out of the study for many reasons. But, you know, <laughs> some people don't, don't go to those groups. So what about all of those others, hundreds perhaps, that were not represented by that group? Extroverts were more likely to speak to me than introverts. And queers and zebras don't like authority. They may not have exerted presence in the group. Um, poor folk can't always afford housing in the areas where I did my study, so they weren't represented. You have to you know, live in Saint-Denis with the, um, the large immigrant class to get an affordable apartment. I didn't go over there. So those were some of the, the problems. And I mentioned these in my study. But at least I was able to achieve some of my goals and, and, and begin to apply the, the social network theory so that others can take off and use that and say, OK, let's apply this to a number of different um, network communities. So that's what I have. Any questions or anything at all that you'd like? talk about? Everybody got all those definitions? <laughs> all righty. Well, all right, thanks. Hey, thanks. Good. I'm just going to sign off here. Thank you very much. You're welcome.